Let me welcome you this evening to our Cafe Church. My name is Tom. I'm one of the pastors here, and you're very warmly welcome. This is a bit different to what we normally do on a Sunday evening. Um, we're not going to be um, singing uh, or any kind of prayers from the front like we normally do. Um, it's a, what we describe as a Cafe Church, a chance this evening to think about a big question um, that the Christian faith throws up and what the Bible has to say on that. We're going to hear from Clover this evening, who's going to present to us. And we've also got an interview a bit later on. Uh, and then a chance uh, later in the evening, just over coffee, to chat about what we've been hearing. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Clover, who's going to take us through the body of our evening. Thanks, mate. Thanks, Tom. Good to see you all. My name's Clover. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, and this evening, we're going to be thinking about that question, did Jesus really rise from the dead? Now, um, it's fair to say, given that I'm the pastor here, uh, you can take a punt on what my answer to that question is going to be. I'm not going to destroy my own job this evening, but we are here for the journey, okay? Now, to be clear, I'm a pastor. I'm not an expert in first century history. I'm not a historian, and I'm not claiming to be. There will be all sorts of questions that I, I wouldn't know the answer to. But I don't think we need to be experts to get our heads around a meaningful answer to that question. The other thing to say is I don't know, I don't know all of you. Uh, so I don't know presently where on this question your thinking is. And this question matters because the answer really does impact people's lives. Even if you think they're mistaken, it's evident that what people understood about that first Easter has changed the world we live in. Now, we're not going to be here forever. This is a subject that's been written on extensively. So in some senses, what I hope to achieve this evening is relatively modest. Um, what I hope to do is show you why you might take that question seriously. Why it's not so strange that people believe the answer is yes. And from there, I and others here would love to carry on that conversation with you. So if we get started, uh, what I want to do is answer that question by working through a series of five questions that I hope will land us at the heart of the matter. Each one builds on the next. And for different people, depending what you presently believe, depends where you'll enter that conversation. So if, as we start, you're thinking, well, I know that, I believe that, but I'm thinking about this, I'm just trying to bring as many of us along together as we can. I accept that on some of the questions, I may say more than you think is necessary, and others I might say a bit less, but I'll be here afterwards, and we can talk more. <coughs> One more important thing, I think, to say is, is that each question, each step, I hope, moves us towards <coughs> answering that question. The first few lay important foundations. I don't think they in themselves prove anything about the resurrection, but they are necessary steps to get to to answer that. I think they're important checkpoints en route, and I hope you'll see that as we go. So, did Jesus really rise from the dead in five questions? And my first question is, does it even matter? Does, is it a question that even needs asking? Not necessarily because we find the idea of an empty tomb about as believable as Game of Thrones, um, but wouldn't it be easier just not to worry about it? We all know that people don't rise from the dead, don't we? We don't believe in fairies, we don't write here be dragons on maps anymore. If people want to believe the resurrection, then that's fine, but it shouldn't be a deal breaker for Christianity or spirituality, should it? Wouldn't a better approach be to focus on the moral core of Christianity? Uh, what Jesus said, rather than the myths that have developed around the centuries about him. See the beauty of, of not literalizing these things. Then, if we take that line, whether or not Jesus even existed isn't actually that important. He is an essence, he is the embodiment of a series of ideas, how to treat others, social justice, care for the underprivileged, and so forth. Now, the supernatural stuff, people may have cared about that in the ancient world, but nowadays, doesn't it just get in the way of understanding who Jesus really is? Couldn't it be simply a metaphor for being spiritually awakened or something? And if we follow that line of reasoning, well, I guess we could take this half of the room and say, you're the people that believe in the resurrection, and this half of the room, you're the people that don't and don't want to. Can't we meet in the middle and say, but don't we think caring about the poor and the needy uh, and, and, and the oppressed and loving one another and being people of peace, isn't that really the essence of Jesus? So what you believe on this side about whether he rose on this side, that doesn't really matter. What we can get together on is, is what Jesus or the idea of Jesus stands for. 
Now, the problem with that approach is that Christianity has always hitched itself to the historical wagon. What I mean by that is Christianity has always declared from the beginning that what happened that first Easter really happened. There was a real Jesus who really died and really rose from the dead. And that what we believe then isn't simply a matter of faith, but a matter of history. And it's really important to get our categories here, because I think sometimes you can get people, so some people would say, I'm on this side of the stage. I'm not interested in faith. I like facts, evidence, and science. That's what I'm about. And people of faith, well, they're over here, and they just choose to believe things. You know, they have some kind of sense that they believe something, and they're satisfied with that, but I'm not. I like my facts, my evidence, and my reason. That's not where Christianity has ever been. Christianity has always claimed that it's based in actual history. Not a history of belief, but of events. And because of that, there's also confusion if people say things like, I don't need to believe in the resurrection, or I don't need to believe in Jesus. I don't feel it necessary for me to. When they mean to say that, they mean I'm not really into religion. I think my life is just fine without it. But if these are matters of history, to say I don't need to believe in Jesus is category confusion. I can genuinely say this evening, I don't need to believe in Napoleon. I don't need to. Uh, whether or not Napoleon existed has no bearing, as far as I'm aware, on my actual life today. But my belief, my belief in him isn't relevant to whether or not he did exist. It's category confusion because it's history that counts. And this is what Paul, who wrote quite a lot of the New Testament, said about the resurrection. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, when we are then found to be false witnesses about God, we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. Now, the, the point of that is right at the beginning, Paul, who's there at the start of the Christian faith, is saying we, without the resurrection, we are totally wasting our time. Totally wasting our time. Because Christianity claims to have answers not simply to life, but to death. So if Jesus' bones just decayed somewhere, and all the rest is nothing more than a nice story, Paul says a terrible mistake has been made. There is no moral core to hold on to if you take away the literal resurrection of Jesus. And if we, if we think it, 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 there is, then we're arguing with one of the people who, who, who founded Christianity, who built its foundations. So the question really does matter because arguably Christianity is meaningless and certainly false if there is no resurrection and we can do away with it. So if we want to think seriously about Christianity, we do have to answer the question, was there a resurrection? But moving on from that, if we say the general question needs answering, I think probably the next thing we need to be clear on is this. Did Jesus actually exist? Because if there's no real Jesus, then of course there's no real resurrection. The whole thing is just made up. And if I can't be sure that Jesus existed, how could I then be sure that he was resurrected? I'm not going to spend long here, but I thought it was worth bringing up because some people aren't sure. I've heard people throw into discussions, well, I'm not really sure there was a Jesus. Can we really know that he even existed? And therefore, we don't need to engage with anything else Christians say because if no Jesus, no Christianity. And that would push everything onto the myth track. If Jesus is much like um, Achilles, for example, possibly someone who somewhere was the origin of a myth, but there's no way of finding out now, a story to be enjoyed but not taken literally, if that's all Jesus is, then again, these questions aren't worth asking. But actually, I don't think historians of the period, regardless of what they believe about Jesus, would argue that he never existed. Um, this lady... Um, is Amy Jill Levine. She's now a retired Jewish scholar and expert on the New Testament period. Now, she would believe very different things about Jesus to me, but she's very typical of modern scholarship. Um, she says this, there is a consensus of sorts on a basic outline of Jesus' life. Most scholars agree that Jesus was baptized by John, debated with fellow Jews on how best to live according to God's will. 
engaged in healings and exorcisms, taught in parables, gathered male and female followers in Galilee, went to Jerusalem, and was crucified by Roman soldiers during the governorship of Pontius Pilate. But to use the old cliche, the devil is in the details. And it's interesting that although there's a lot of opposition to Christianity in its early years, no one runs the argument that Jesus never existed. They engage with the historical figure of Jesus, which is striking. They argue about who he was. As she says, the devil is in the details, not whether there was a Jesus at all. Now, if Jesus existed, then we can all agree that he died. That's not controversial either. Everyone agrees that Jesus died. It's in the Gospels. They don't debate that. Secular historians would be clear he died. Christians, obviously, Good Friday, believe he died. Everyone is on the same page as to whether Jesus died. The question is, what happened next? Now, there was a brief period, it started about 200 years ago, when the resurrection of Jesus was explained as a Possibly, he never actually died. He simply passed out, uh, was buried, everyone thought he was dead, and then he reappeared later to much acclaim and said that he had conquered death. Now, that is certainly a modern invention around 1780, and it isn't really taken seriously now for reasons you might guess. Uh, Firstly, because it requires the Romans to have made a colossal mistake and botched the execution. Uh, to not know the difference between someone fainting and someone dying. And that seems very unlikely. But it is possible, of course, everyone in this room has had a bad day in the office, and maybe they did that day, and that's how all this started. Of course, it does require everyone there to have had a bad day in the office, the Roman soldiers, their centurion, the people that wrapped up his body, the people that took him off and buried him. It requires all of them to have not noticed that his heart was still beating, that he was still breathing, and the total absence of the signs of death. Now, if any of you in this room have seen a dead body, you will know what I mean by the signs of death, how dead someone starts to look very, very quickly. And what we're saying is that was entirely missed by all of those people. But not only that, and this is what I think is more significant, not only does it require everyone to fail to recognize death, it requires the disciples who propagate the story to fail to recognize life. Think about it. Jesus was flogged and crucified. If he had a spike through his feet, that alone, I understand, would have prevented him from walking, possibly permanently, but at least for months. Likely, it would have become infected with his other wounds. Uh, Crucifixion in Roman times wasn't the sanitary thing that lethal injection is. Now, the idea that someone who is a bleeding, pussy mess, sorry to say that, but it's, it's the way it would have been, had crawled because he was no longer able to walk and convinced everyone that in fact he had conquered death and was to be worshipped as God is absurd. There is no way that that is what happened and hence modern critics and skeptics alike have abandoned that line of inquiry. But that leads me to question three because the fact that Jesus existed, the fact he died, that doesn't prove that there was a resurrection. In fact, I think it leads us to this question. Couldn't the resurrection have been added later as a new ending? Because sometimes a story just doesn't land, does it? You've all seen films. You've all seen films where the way it ended, you were disappointed with. You've all watched series on Netflix, and you've got eight, 12 episodes through, and you watch the final one, and you wish they'd they'd, they'd written something different because it just didn't fit. Now, is that what we've got with the resurrection, an alternate ending? Because people thought Jesus was brilliant. They loved his teaching, they loved his character, and the fact that he just died was hugely disappointing to them. And so his resurrection is a fictional ending to a true historic story. It's just a better one that people liked, and so it caught on. Now, I've I've, I've met people who've explained to me that their view of things is that whilst Jesus was real, over the centuries, all the miraculous stuff, especially the resurrection, gets added to the bones of, of the story of Jesus. And he was an extraordinary man, but as time went by, more and more layers go on until you end up with the idea that he did miraculous things, and in fact, from there, that eventually the greatest miracle of all happened, he conquered death. And that's how we end up where we are today, 2,000 years on. But again, we know, we know for a fact this explanation cannot be correct. It can't be. 
Whatever we may or may not believe about the resurrection, it is definitely not a late addition to the story. Definitely not. The evidence is there that it was part of what people believed right from the start. Now, myths can start early. Of course they can. But we can't refuse to consider the resurrection on the basis that it is a late, much later addition to the story of Jesus. And how do we know that? Two key bits of evidence for you. First is how quickly the story spread. Now, this slide, I know you probably can't make that. that that's the world as it was, or Europe as it was, at the time of Jesus. The, the darker color is the Roman Empire. And I'm going to circle two cities for us. There's Rome and there's Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is the starting place of Christianity. Rome is the capital of the Roman Empire, obviously. July AD 64 was the great fire of Rome, um, about 30 years after the crucifixion. Rome burnt for six days. There was significant damage to the city. And the Emperor Nero blamed Christians for it. Now, that means in the time between Jesus dying and the great fire of Rome, Christianity had spread all the way from Jerusalem to Rome. Now, direct by plane, that's 1,430 miles. Of course, there are no planes at that time. It's a long way to travel in the ancient world. For context, it's, it's slightly further to go direct from London to St. Petersburg. So in that 30-year period, it not only spread that far, but it had spread for a distinct group to form who Nero was able to blame for this fire. In fact, the respected Roman historian Tacitus, who wasn't a friend of Christians, by the way, wrote that by this time, Christianity had spread like a disease, and there was a multitude of believers in Rome. Now, that certainly doesn't allow for the late invention of the story of the resurrection. It simply cannot have been made up and added centuries on over time. Well within the lifetime of the people who were there, this is happening. If there was a Christian community in Rome by AD 64, and people started believing the resurrection in Jerusalem way before that, then it must have become part of what people believed very close to the events themselves. That's the first bit of evidence, the way the story spread. The second I want to show you is to think about one particular individual, the Apostle Paul. Now, he's famous for spreading the message that Jesus had ridden, risen around the Mediterranean. Now, he becomes a Christian only a few years after the events, but he dies at a not dissimilar time to the great fire in Rome. And he was proclaiming the resurrection decades before his death. Here's a couple of examples. Um, this is from the earliest of um, Paul's letters that we have. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell us how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. Now, I should say the, this evening, some people argue about which letters Paul actually wrote. All the letters I'm going to quote from this evening are ones that people don't argue about that historians across the board believe that Paul, the historic Paul, wrote. So I'm using those particularly this evening. And he wrote this some 15 to 18 years-ish after the first Easter. Now, this one's only slightly uh, later, but it's another important one. 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, For what I received I pass on to you as first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's another name for Peter, and then to the twelve. Now, I know that Paul writing it doesn't mean that it happened. That's not what I'm saying. I want to be clear on that. But what we can't do is base our rejection of the resurrection on the idea that it was a myth that came up years, decades, centuries later. That's simply historically inaccurate. And this quote's important because it shows what Paul was believing and what Paul was teaching. And that he must have been doing it for some time to have authority to write this letter. The message had spread and he's reminding them of what they're previously known. So, so him teaching this predates this letter. It shows his teaching went, much, much, went back much further, because if you look at how he frames it, he says, for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Paul's saying, 
This is something that I learned that I passed on to you. Those are actually technical words that they would have used at the time for rabbinical teaching. To receive something and to pass it on was the job of a rabbi. He says it's of first importance, of first importance. So he's saying you can't strip this out. This is at the core of Christianity. And third, the way that it's written, actually in the original, reads like it's a creed that someone else has written, like it's a quote from a hymn, something that Christians at the time believed. He's saying, I received this and I passed it on. Now, given that Paul became a Christian only a few years after the resurrection, this means this belief was there right from the start. Now, I'm not claiming that proves the resurrection happened, but I do think it shows it was believed at the time. And if that's the case, it gives us more reason to take it seriously. We can't dismiss it as a late invention and improved story decades on, especially when we remember that Christianity starts in Jerusalem, the very place where all this is said to have happened. Now, it's one thing, isn't it? If you make up a story about somewhere that's far off and you, you, know, you tell people in London that this happened in St. Petersburg and they've got no way of checking it out and you assure them that this is definitely what happened and they start to believe you, that's one thing. It's very different if you try and tell the people in St. Petersburg that that thing happened and they were there at the time and they go, no, it didn't because I was living here at the time. That absolutely did not happen. But of course, Christianity starts in the very place the events are supposed to have happened at that very time. So contemporary witness evidence would have been available. Now, we can take issue with it, but we can't dismiss it as a myth that was added on later and gained traction over the centuries. And that brings us to the fourth question, probably the key one tonight. But why believe Jesus actually wrote this? Okay, if we accept that he existed and we accept that he died, and even if we accept the story that he rose came about early, given how improbable resurrection generally is, why give it a hearing? And of course, it's right not to run to a supernatural explanation of things. We wouldn't do that anywhere else in life. We may like the idea that someone's conquered death. We may find a good deal of comfort in that at times of distress. We may say that has social utility, but that doesn't make it true. Now, there's a few reasons I want to introduce why we should think about this Now, there's not time for detail, but these are some of the reasons why you might take the resurrection seriously. So if you're wondering about it, you're thinking about it this evening, you won't feel like a fool for asking more questions. Here we go. The first is to say that crucifixion is a really bad ending to a life. It's a shameful death. Now, we're impacted today in Bath by the effect that Christianity has had on culture. People wear crosses as jewelry and so forth. We don't find it at all shocking because we never expect to see someone crucified, do we? We're relieved that that's not part of the modern world. We don't feel the way that people in the first century felt about crucifixion because it's not part of our lives. But crucifixion was essentially a way of marking someone out as scum. To end up being crucified was the very definition of losing. It was the brutal ray that the Romans cancelled people. If you wanted someone's follower count to drop to zero, you crucified them. Shame stuck to it. You were rendered a pathetic, pitiable, naked creature, not simply defeated by Rome, but crushed. Its intention was to end your legacy, not to help you start one. You lived on solely in Rome's eyes as a warning not to be followed. Now, you wouldn't make this up if you wanted something that would gain traction. And if it did happen, it was the ultimate way, in one sense, to stop something getting off the ground. It's not an attractive way in the first century to start a story of someone you're saying should be worshipped. And yet it did, from the start, as we've seen, gain more than traction. Even Christianity's opponent, you remember Tacitus saying, it spread like a disease. It caught on. Why? The second thing to say is that Jesus was buried in a known tomb. That's what stops the idea that potentially all of this is just an honest mistake. The idea that what happened was the disciples and everyone else, there was, there was a tomb here which had Jesus' remains in it, and there's a tomb next door that's empty, and they accidentally picked the wrong one, opened it up, there's nothing there, and they go, well, he must have risen from the dead. 
The tomb is owned by an official called Joseph of Arimathea. Um, He's a member of the Jewish government. So a bit like a cabinet minister. Now again, remember this happened just after, this is all recorded just after it happened. So if I today told you a story about last year and invented a member of the government for my story, you would know, you might think, I'm not, I don't remember that minister, and you'd be able to check, and other people around you would go, that never happened, it can't do, because that person is a work of fiction. So if you say, if you say someone is buried in so-and-so's tomb, at that time, you give the name of whom it belonged to, at the time, people were on, there's no such person as Joseph of Arimathea, and there's no such tomb. And he's not an obscure character, He's named to be a member of the Jewish government. So he's not just some random name that they made up. You know, Joseph of Arimathea is not the Jewish equivalent of Joe Bloggs or John Smith. They name him, they name his job, and they talk about his tomb. Now, given the authorities opposed Christianity from the start, the Romans and the Jewish authorities alike, it would be very easy. They could have just gone, that never existed. He never existed. No tomb, this story is clearly made up. And we mustn't treat people in the first century like they were credulous idiots who would believe anything. The idea that people were so keen to believe that they wouldn't check facts. If this had been an honest mistake and the disciples had been wandering around going, he has risen because they've gone to the wrong tomb, some would have gone, no he hasn't, he's in here. Because there were lots of people who had a vested interest in saying that. And again, remember, this is happening at the time. It's not decades later. It's not centuries later after memories have faded and tombs have overgrown and things have changed. This is happening at the time. And it catches on like wildfire. But if it wasn't an honest mistake, is it possible then it was a deliberate ploy? Someone steals the body of Jesus and thus the tomb is genuinely empty. They check the right one and they go, he is risen. But in fact, he's not. He's out the back somewhere. The question then is, who would do that? An unknown joker? Well, it's unthinkable that someone would have risked that. I think we would probably think of grave robbing as still a pretty low thing to do. It doesn't compare to how low it was regarded in the first century, and the consequences would have been that you ended up like Jesus. No one would have taken that risk for a laugh. And then the other possibilities are the authorities, Well, the Roman and Jewish authorities have no motive for stealing the body of Jesus. They want him dead, and they don't want people following him. That's the whole point. The disciples, well, why would they do it? Was it because they were gutted that it had ended this way, and actually this enabled them to carry on the story of Jesus and achieve some kind of victory? Well, given the cost to them, personally, that doesn't seem believable either. Remember, this is happening straight after the events. So when they stole it, they're putting themselves in the firing line immediately. Somehow they're, they're getting around every way in which it, the, the, the body was protected and sealed. And they're putting themselves in line to join Jesus on a cross. I would do anything not to run the risk of being crucified myself. And I suspect the disciples were no different to me or you on that. And yet the early Christian martyrs stuck to this story. And I just want to think about three of them very, very briefly. And we have Peter, we have Paul, and we have James. Now, Peter was martyred in Rome, probably around the fire that I mentioned earlier, uh, when Nero really turned on the church. And it's one thing to make up a story. It's quite another thing to die for it. There comes a point, if you've ever lied and you've been caught in it, where you realize that you better come clean. And that point is long before you end up being executed for holding to it. There's Paul, who likewise died in similar circumstances at a similar time. But the most interesting one to me is James. Now, this is James the Just, which is to distinguish him from all the other Jameses that are in the Bible and were around the time, popular name. James was the brother of Jesus. And unlike Peter and Paul, he was executed in, in Jerusalem. He was stoned. And he was stoned because he believed his own brother had been raised from the dead. Now, if you look at the Gospel of Mark, which is the earliest of the Gospels, which is written before James died, okay? So, everything he says about James would be open to challenge because they're to go, yeah, we know that guy and that's not true. This is what it says. And and Jesus 
it doesn't, well, sorry, James doesn't come over well. Uh, James and the rest of the family were skeptics. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. Yet, James moves from this to leading the church in Jerusalem to dying for believing who his brother really was. Why? That is not an unreasonable question to ask, is it? To go from saying, my brother has lost his mind, to going, my brother is a son of God and I will die for believing that. Because that's the journey Jesus made. Sorry, James made. Now, something I've not said much about, um, because I've wanted to walk us through to this point, is if you look for the Gospels yourself, you'll find that these people did not believe simply because they saw an empty tomb. The evidence they gave was that they had seen Jesus himself. That's what changed James's mind. And as the brother of Jesus, the younger brother of Jesus, he would have known Jesus literally all his life. And it's not credible to think someone fooled him about who he had met. If you've got siblings, you would know if you met one of them. You would recognize them. You've known them their whole lives, your whole lives. James was no different. And it's important to note the Bible doesn't say when it talks about the resurrection of Jesus that people saw a, a ghost or, or some vague apparition or a dream. Jesus walks, he talks, he can be touched, he eats. This is what they testified they'd experienced. No one, no one gives any evidence of a ghostly, ethereal, vaguely hallucinogenic, mystical Jesus. No one says that. That's no one's evidence. So we can't go down that route. If I say that, I'm just writing history myself because that's no one's testimony. Their testimony is that they saw Jesus, they touched Jesus, they ate meals with Jesus after he rose. That's the evidence. Now, if I died today for being a Christian, if it was illegal, if I was in one of the countries in the world where you could be persecuted or put to death for being a Christian, I would be putting my faith, I would be resting on the evidence of others, the kind of things we've been looking at this evening the testimony of the Gospels. But all three of these men and others didn't die for what people had told them. They died for what they had seen themselves. And that puts them in a different category of order. Each of them was taking their stand on what they had seen and come to believe, as did all of the early martyrs. Now we've got this far. And I would say that at the very least we can say there are good reasons for us all to think seriously about that question of the resurrection. Now, what I'd like is to suggest a couple of books that you might like to think about if you uh, wanted to read up. One of them is The Case for Easter by Lee Strobel. There's actually copies of that on the table at the back. You can take it. If you want something uh, that, that, that's more substantive, The Case for the Resurrection of Jesus by Gary Habermas is an excellent book. It's very thorough. If you aren't much of a reader, just look up Gary Habermas on YouTube and you'll find him doing that book in lecture form, which you may find easier. But they're so helpful and he looks at everything we've looked at this evening in more detail. But the thing I'd always say is the place to start would be by reading one of the Gospels for yourself, part of the Bible. And before I wrap up with some final thoughts, I just want to have a quick chat with a friend of mine, um, Dom, would you like to join me? Yep. Uh, so before we start, I'm just wondering, how many of you, put your hand up if you know Dom. There we are, it's a handful of us. You'll see why in a moment. So Dom, tell us a bit about yourself, uh, where you grew up, what you do, that kind of stuff. Uh, I grew up in Bath. I've lived in my whole life. Um, I went to Swainswick Primary School here, and then Beach and Cliff. Um, didn't grow up with a religious family, no one Christian. Mm -hmm. um, and then became a gardener, been a gardener for about 10 years. And it was during my gardening career that I met uh, someone that I became close friends with, Anna, who's a very devout Christian, mm. who opened me up to the idea of um, believing in Christ. Mm. Mm. And when did you first come here? So I came here about two months ago. Two months, okay. 
And what brought you here? Why did you start coming two months ago? I reached out to the church because I read the Gospels for the first time last year, and it had a profound impact on me. So I reached out to a few churches. This was the first church that got back to me. Yeah. So last year, you, you read the Gospels for yourself for the first time. What, what made you do that? Well, a, a personal desire to understand if there was truth mm. was partly it, but also having such a close friend that I really respected her opinion, and she would talk to me frequently about faith and Jesus. It took, I mean, I resisted it for a long time, mm. but I just felt a kind of, I want to explore this. Mm. I want to at least be open to this. Mm. I certainly didn't go into reading the Gospels thinking, please be true. Mm. I went in with a, a total open mind about, mm. about it. Yeah. So your friend had told you about Jesus, but you took the decision that actually you would look for yourself, and you did that by, by reading the Gospels. Yeah. And as you, as you read those, what effect did they have on you? I mean, they had a transformative effect on me. I, I felt very quickly that to live by Jesus' teachings, you couldn't go wrong. That, that was the first thing. Mm. And initially just thought, well, this is just beautiful philosophical truth. Mm. I couldn't find any fault in that. And that led me to wanting to understand all the questions you've kind of raised today. Well, who, who is Jesus? How sure can I be about the other claims he have, mm. has? So, yeah. Mm. And, and that kind of takes us to where we, we started this evening with, some people would say, well, Dom, that's, that's great. You know, uh, that philosophical stuff, that's brilliant. That's the stuff we can take out of Christianity. That's the stuff to leave, lift out of it. But the stuff like actually believing he rose from the dead, that's the stuff to leave behind. It, have you left that behind, or, or would you say that you actually believe that there's oh, no, a real I, Jesus who rose from the dead? I actually believe that, yeah. Yeah, that Jesus existed and was the Son of God and was raised from the dead. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. And, yeah. and that conviction came to you principally because you, you read the Gospels themselves? That was the starting place for me, was reading mm. the Gospels. Yeah. So at this point, how, how long would you say roughly that you've been following Jesus? I think roughly four months. Yeah. So I mean, I'm still very near, still a, long, a lot to learn. And a lot a of lot people to here to meet. The only thing I've, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and the people I have met, I've had a very warm welcome here. It's been, Good. It's been wonderful Good. so far. Yeah. So um, if someone here didn't grow up in church, like like you didn't, and they don't know much about all this, would you recommend they read the Gospels, or do you think they'll find them too hard to understand? No, I think that's, that's the best place to start. If someone says start at the beginning of the Bible, mm. I mean, it was recommended to me, start, start with the Gospels. They're, mm. they're easy to read and easy to understand. There's four accounts, mm. so you get four different perspectives of the people that were closest to him. Mm. And that's another thing that you know, was important to me, is these are eyewitness accounts. Mm. They're not just stories. These are the people that lived with Jesus. Mm. Mm. So, no, I think it's, it's a good place to start, and I would, I would definitely encourage anybody that's still unsure to start in that place because mm. mm. it's hard to just hear someone say, believe, because I believe. You know, that yeah. was hard for me. I, didn't, mm. I had a friend I was very close to that encouraged me all the time, but it took reading them for me. You know, mm. That was when I had the profound change. Mm. Mm. So... What's next to you, Don? Next step is to be baptized here. Excellent. Yeah. And when will that be? That's the 28th of April. Okay. Which will be, yeah, on a Sunday. And if there are people here who would like to hear more of your story, because you'll be sharing more I will about be doing a occasion. testimony. Yeah. yeah. Will they be welcome to come and In front and of hear? a full house. Absolutely. Anybody is welcome. Yeah. 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 So that's the 28th of 28th April. 28th of the April, 10.30. Brilliant. Looking yeah. forward to it. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks very much, Don. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Now, just one more question to go as we wrap up. Because it's one thing to say the resurrection may or may not have happened. It's another to understand its significance. As the final question is, is the one that takes it to the heart of it, because did it happen? That's a historical question. What does it mean is a theological one? So what? What does it matter anyway? 
It, and, and even if we can't work out what, what, what if we can't work out what happened, are we are we too far from there? Even if we can't say, we can say, well, I can't answer what happened. But we're so far from the events now, and not everyone agrees. How am I ever going to get to the bottom of it? Is it even worth thinking about? Well, the Bible says there is a why to why Jesus came to ri- uh, came to die and rise again. Because we might think it was only to approve that he had extraordinary powers, that he was different class. So that Jesus may have thought, well, if I need them to believe in me, I need them to believe I'm the son of God, what might I do? Well, dying and coming to life, that would, that, that, that would solve that one. That will prove it. Now, the resurrection is a display of power, but it is much more than that. If, it was just a, if Jesus just wanted to display his power, he could have done any number of extraordinary things. Um, he could have flown. He could have flown. He could have zoomed around the streets of ancient Jerusalem doing the Superman, and that would have proved people then, they knew people you know, didn't come back to life, but they also knew people didn't fly. So if it was simply a demonstration of remarkable supernatural power, he could have done something else. There were far, far less painful ways of proving that you were extraordinary than coming back from a death by crucifixion. All kinds of stunts you could have done. That is not the point. Rising from the dead does prove who Jesus is, but it's far more than that. It proves what he came to do. And as I've said, the resurrection wasn't a metaphor at any level. It's not a mere picture of spiritual life. It's God's solution to your and my biggest problem. Now, I know some people would say, look, um, I don't need to worry about the resurrection because I can look at the world around me. I don't need to worry what the evidence is for a resurrection because I can look at the world around me and I think that gives me enough evidence that God doesn't exist. Pain I see, confusion I see, conflict I see, God I don't see. If he exists, either he's not that powerful or he doesn't care or he's just plain incompetent, whatever, he is not relevant to my life. But you see, the world around us, according to the Bible, is not as it was first made. Not as it was first made. The Bible says the world was made perfect, not with conflict or disease or confusion or, most importantly, death. And that we saw God face to face. We communicated him without doubt. But then it got broken. Sin doing our own thing instead of what God says, it ruined everything. And it's something none of us can get away from. See, sin isn't so much this little thing or that big thing that we do. It is an entire orientation of heart that ignores God, that says this world, or at least my part of it, is mine, not yours. You are nothing to do with this. See, we we experience things that are good and beautiful in this life. We all do. But we also see the scars that our world bears on the outside. You see those in the news. And we all know about the dirt on the inside too, the things that go through our hearts and minds, that it is a massive relief to you right now that the person on your right and on your left does not know about. The thing is, God does. He knows it all. He's perfect. That stuff separates us from him. We are here and God is here. And because God is just, there is a reckoning for us all. And the fact that we're all in the same boat doesn't help us if that boat is the spiritual equivalent of Titanic. The comfort of going down together is pretty thin. But the whole of the Easter story, that is the real comfort in the face of death. That Jesus is sorting this out for us. That he is the bridge between us and God. He is paying our way back. That is what the cross is about. And so his resurrection is not a stunt or even a really good one. It is Jesus doing what we couldn't. The death and resurrection of Jesus is him fixing death for all who will trust him. Which means that the so what of the resurrection is actually that it's God speaking to you and to me. Dealing with the confusion that we experience there are so many different spiritual ideas in the world, so many people saying different things. This is what God is saying. He acted definitively in history and had it recorded to give us more than just clarity, to give us hope. Hope that death needn't be the final step in our story, that it isn't the full stop in your life and mine. Hope for how we live today, because this isn't an insurance policy for the day that you die. It's about the way that you live. 
The whole of Jesus' story tells us that, all the things that were drawing Dom in. But perhaps, I think, in some ways, it's captured by this quote. You don't find leaders today saying anything like this. Jesus called them his disciples together. Now, the context of this is disciples essentially arguing about who's best. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. See that today, people who lord their authority. What does Jesus, the Son of God, say? Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, that's Jesus referring to himself, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. If Jesus is God in the flesh, in human form, which the Bible insists that he is, this is a whole new way of doing life, where power is wielded, not for your own sake, but to serve, as Jesus demonstrated himself by giving his own life as a ransom for many. That is the claim of the Bible, that the real God, the God of the universe, the God who made you and me, was prepared to do this, to be brought back into relationship with us. That is the so what of the resurrection, which is why as Christians we believe that Jesus is utterly unique, that in him we can find not only the answers to our deepest needs and questions, but the power to be the people we were created to be, both now and in eternity, because God acted in history to give you and I clarity and hope. Thank you for listening. Tom.